Our today's keynote speaker, Professor Shankar Mantha, former chairman AICT. Professor S. S. Mantha is an Indian academician and administrator based in Mumbai, Maharashtra, currently serving as a CEO of Mahaprit Strata Knowledge Center, Mumbai, and adjunct professor of National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. He is also the former chairman of All India Council of Technical Education, a statutory board at the National Level Council for the Technical Education under the Department of Higher Education, established in 1945. So, uh, may I request all the participants to please mute your mobile phone. Moving on, he has served as the president of National Board of Accreditation and the deputy vice chancellor of SNDT Women's University, Mumbai. He also served as the chancellor of KL University. He heads the National Technical Committee, National Cyber Safety and Security Standards. He has awarded the honorary doctorate degree, doctorate of science by this uh, was uh, Varya uh, Technological University, Karnataka in 2012 and by D.Y. Patel in International, International University, Maharashtra in 2014. Professor A.S. Mantha was born and grew up in Mumbai, Maharashtra. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the Mahara, uh, Maharaja Shivaji Rao University of Baroda and earned the master degree in mechanical engineering uh, from VJITI in Mumbai. He also holds a PhD in combustion modeling from the University of Mumbai. Professor A.S. Mantha, appointed as a chairman of AICT in 2012, where he spent six years convincing and implementing the e-governance reforms to follow to allow the transfer, uh, uh, transparent administration and created the regulations for blended learning uh, paradigm uh, and the regulations for the twinning programs in engineering and technology. Mantha was professor of robotics and artificial intelligence in the department of mechanical engineering at uh, Veer Mata Jijabai uh, Technological Institute. He has advised uh, the National E-Governance Division and Government of Maharashtra on IT initiatives, including the Citizen Felicitation Center of Kalyani Domjiva Vili um, uh, Municipal Corporation and contributed to Indian accreditation system to be a part of Washington Accord. He was instrumented in creating uh, the National Vocational Educational Qualification Framework, which was later re christianized as the National Skill Qualification Framework, uh, NSQA. He has more than 280 publications in the national and international journals and conference proceedings, and has contributed over 250 articles in education and administration to publications. Professor Mantha was awarded the Lal Bahadur Shastri Exemplar in the Integrity by Rethink India Foundation. He received SKOCA Scotch Award uh, for the e-governance initiatives at AICT 2014. He received the Lifetime Achievement Award in the field of education and SOE Global Education Awards in 2013-14. He received the fifth national Telecom Awards for Excellence in Education through e-governance from CMM and Star News in 2011. He was awarded the Best Teacher Award of Maharashtra from the Government of Maharashtra in 2002. So welcome yourself with this note. I just uh, request you to be on the platform and now the platform is yours, sir. Please. Thank you. Thank, uh, thank you, my um, friends, the other side, Dr. Ghosh, Dr. Bakshi, and uh, for the introduction by Chandra Mukherjee. Thank you. Uh, 
and uh, I feel privileged to be with uh, you all today and would uh, speak to you on a few thoughts that I had on uh, the national education policy. Now, I would like to, I have a presentation which I would like to uh, share. So let's see. So is that visible? Is the presentation visible? Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the national education policy that we all know of, you know, accepted by the government in 2020 has several provisions which are extremely useful and facilitating in terms of future education. Let's see some of the features and analyze some of them in, in, the, uh, in, its, it, in its implementation as well as in its <coughs> understanding. <coughs> Sorry. The, one of the main theme that runs through the education policy is the spirit of education, which means let noble thoughts come to us from every side. That's, that's the theme on which the entire policy is based on. And the other important part which appears in the policy at various times is also the Atma Nirbharta. How do we make ourselves self-reliant in terms of education, in terms of any other facet that we have in, our, in order to conduct our lives? So the underlying theme here is Sarvam Paravasham Dukkham, Sarvam Atma Vasham Sukham. Anything that is there in others' control will cause us agony, pain. Sarvam Paravasham Dukkham and Sarvam Atma Vasham Sukham, which means anything that is there in our control will get us happiness. Now, all the education that we are talking about must conform to these principles. There are some foundational pillars of access, equity, quality, and affordability that become the parameters on which NEP is built. Access, everybody should have an access to education in the same way as anyone would get, that's equity. Quality, the same quality of education must be there and it should be affordable. Now, these are some of the points by which our education would move in times to come. There is a sustainable development that's very important for us. The, the policy also talks about the development goal four of the sustainable development goals, which are 17 in number. The fourth one is education. India is a signatory to SDG, and that also forms a part of the NEP. As far as our education system is concerned, it's fairly large. The last count was around 1,060 universities, about 40,000 colleges. They all these have actually stood the time of time, uh, test of time, and we are all products of those institutions and universities. But the GER, the gross enrollment ratio, is 27 today, and which means that 73 students out of every hundred are sitting outside. Those who can actually go to college, but don't go to college, only 27 out of every 100 go to higher education colleges. The remaining 73 of for every 100, though they are eligible, they have to sit outside because they have to support their families. Their financial condition is not uh, good enough to support their own education. So therefore, the gross enrollment ratio must increase way beyond the current number. And the national education policy also talks about raising the gross enrollment ratio to about 50 in the next uh, decade and a half. The 2035 is what the policy says. Now, how those things can be done is something that we will see. There is an intent and the content. The content of the, the intent and the content, both within the policy, are extremely good. There is an intent to improve the systems and the content supports the intent. 
So therefore, nothing is there to fault in the intent, but the content needs implementation and that can be a challenge. But as we all know, challenges have intrinsic opportunities. So therefore, NEP gives us a lot of opportunities. Now, one of the points that we need to understand here is to see how corporations have unlocked value through stressed times. They were all, the industry was also stressed at some time, but they have come out of that. Today, probably education is also stressed and we need to look at the industry to believe how we can come out of our stressed times. So therefore, if, we, if you know the industrial uh, you know, revolutions and what happened then, the, some of the corporations like GM, DuPont, they created business units structured around products and geographic markets. And the smaller business units sacrifice turnovers of flexibility and adaptability. Therefore, the education also must do its business, conduct its business through structured programs, through structured courses, and one that meets the demands of the society. And they must be flexible, they must be adaptable, like the industry adapted themselves to the changing conditions. We all know again, the new education policy talks about student centric education. Professor Bakshi, I believe, spoke about that. And future will be certainly personalized learning. But having said that, there are a lot of, you know, uh, things that have to be sorted out first, you know, when we really implement personalized learning. Now, before going into the policy itself, let's do some reality check where we are and where we need to go. More than 60% of our population is below 30 years of age. And we need an equitable education to serve all the disparities, whether it's caste, class, religion, gender, or disabilities, or whatever. Some of the education funding over the years has gone down. And one of the important parameters that defines equity is also the curriculum. So insert, assert, they all must address the concerns past, present, and some of them are doing that in the new documents that are being released. Now, foundational literacy is also something that's talked about. Numeracy, numeracy is talked about within NAP, and that's extremely important. Like the, pol the first education policy, the current education policy, there have been four between them, and every one of them has been talking about 6% of gross, uh, you know, uh, project, uh, product, 6% uh, of GDP for education. And uh, in order to meet the objectives, probably you need even more. But unfortunately, what happens is, in practice, this GDP in, on education has never been more than 3%. So there must be mechanisms put in place which raises this bar, gets the investment on education to almost 6% of the GDP. And that's what will actually drive the Atman Erbarta in education. The, before going to higher education, very briefly, the NEP talks about setting up new schools, new establishments, and emerging new institutions. These are all ideas worth exploring. If you know the primary gross enrollment ratio, is about 98. And when you come to secondary education, it's the gross enrollment ratio falls to about 75, which means there are a lot of dropouts from primary between primary and secondary education. So and when you go to higher education, it becomes 27. One of the main reasons for this is that we have several primary schools in almost all the locations. But when you come down to secondary schools, we have a lot of work to do. Therefore, the, the children uh, do not prefer to travel and join a secondary school, which is outside their, their town, and therefore the dropouts happen. Now here, the NEP talks about establishing new schools, new establishments, merging institutions. So all that is expected to improve the secondary GER. Then we have a new model, three plus two plus three plus four, the the pre, pre 
uh, schooling effort has come into the uh, def definition of education. So this in a way means that we need to regularize the Anganwadi workers, which may not be all that easy, knowing the qualifications and the way we define the Anganwadi workers. Then we, uh, we have a large system of private schools, public schools and so on. How to rationalize the delivery systems within these two models is also probably a question that we need to answer. Then exper experiential learning, flipped classroom models, they all must be built into the curriculum, which is also a part of the national education policy. And it's imperative to convert all the primary and schools to secondary level and improve the infrastructure so that the dropouts reduce and our secondary uh, GER improves. And if secondary GER improves, the higher education GER will also automatically improve. There is also debate within the NEP of English versus the others. Now, there is no saying, uh, there is nothing to uh, object when people say that the education must happen in the local languages. It's a very good idea, it must happen. However, we need to also provide, uh, you know, edu uh, the employment opportunities in, in every uh, state. For example, there are several states in the Northeast. There are, there are states in the South like Kerala and so on, where employment opportunities are not very good. Now, if we limit the education to local language in these states, then their movement could be hampered and therefore their employment status can be affected. So therefore we need to create a lot of supporting infrastructure before we turn to local language education and so on. But school education probably could be done in uh, the local language, but higher education, there must be some element of integration with different cultures, different states, different languages and so on. Probably English, mother tongue and, and one uh, language like Sanskrit could be a good combination basically because uh, the, all of our Indian languages, they origin from Sanskrit and it's easy to learn our local languages if there is a basis in that we have in Sanskrit. Anyway, these are points to debate. There can be nothing uh, right or nothing wrong in these uh, uh, in these points and uh, so therefore that's about the school education now let's look at the reforms in higher education now ger in higher education is to be raised by 50 percent by 2035 now how is this going to be done the we have we already have about 1060 universities and about 40,000 institutions, like I said earlier. Now, if you really uh, want to, and the GER currently is about 27. If you want to double the GER, technically it may mean that we need to raise the number of universities by uh, twice the number. And we also need to increase the institutions that we have, which is, which is currently about 40,000 to almost 80,000. Now, Building these many universities, these many institutions in the new structure is extremely difficult and probably not possible because investments are very, very high. Investments are going to be very high. Now, even if someone, someone were to build those new universities, new institutions, there is no guarantee that students would flock to those institutions, universities raising the GER because most of the children, like I said, have financial difficulties. Most of the parents uh, have cannot support their children. They have to work during the day and therefore they cannot you know, join a regular college. So they, some of them go to distance education. Some of them work, uh, study in the evening, during the weekends and so on. But so how do we raise the GER from 27 to 50 under this condition? So the only way out is create a digital learning platform and build a complete traditional university ecosystem on the digital platform and then enroll students anywhere in the country to on the digital platform, provide them complete experience of actually going to a college on the digital platform. Now that's, that's probably something that can be done in the next two, three years and probably in, in the next decade or so, 
not only 50, but even more of GER can be achieved. Now, the, the higher education curriculum should have flexibility of subjects. A lot of uh, this I'll talk to you in the next uh, slide, uh, which, which is... Hello. So, uh, sorry. So the uh, higher education curriculum must have flexibility of subjects and therefore that needs a lot of understanding of what is flexibility in subjects and what is, you know, personalized learning and so on. Now, uh, the next is multi-point entry exit. In fact, in total, National education policy has three primary features which we must understand. First is multiple entry exit. The second is academic bank of credits. And the third is personalized learning. These three are from an implementation perspective and we need to understand them well. Now, first, first of all, let's look at multi-point entry exit. In, a, in an institution, we, the NEP also talks about now a, a four-year undergraduate program, which means that you have after 12th, four years to graduation. If somebody completes one year of those four years of graduation, he gets a certification. If he can com completes two years, he gets a diploma. If he completes three years, he gets a degree. And if he completes four years, he gets an honors degree with extra credits and so on. So some more value addition on the graduation program and so on. Now the uh, simply multi-point entry exit means in these four years, I can exit at any time and I can enter back the system at any time, which means if after one year, after 12, I get a certificate and I can exit the system go out, work for some time, come back and rejoin the system. The same applies after two years, after three years, after four years. So I can go out, maybe work, make some money, come back. Maybe the current academics I do not like. So therefore I drop out after two years, find out more interests of mine, which interests me. And after three, four years, if I feel like I want to pursue my education, I come back, join the system and take off from the place where I have left. Now, this concept is multi-point entry exit. Having understood the concept, let's see the dynamics of this. Now, first of all, the first question is, why must a student drop out after first year or second or third year and why should he come back into the system and so on the reason is very simple the <clears throat> he has financial problems and probably he wants to make some money and come back and the second reason is he is not interested in the kind of education that is happening in the college he has a attempted to learn for one year, two years, and then he felt he can't, you know, go any further. So therefore, both these reasons, he may drop out. For both of these reasons, he may drop out. And he may come back because at some point of time later, he feels that he should complete his graduation. Now, that is the, that is the basic idea. But unless I get a certain job after I drop out after first year or second year or third year, there is no point in dropping out. If I drop out after first year, I have a certification. With that certificate, I should be able to find a job in the industry outside. Or after second year, I get a diploma. With that diploma, what are skill sets I have? With that diploma, with those skill sets, I should be able to find a job in the industry. Now, if there is no job defined for the skill sets that I have after first, second, third years, then there is no point in dropping out. So therefore, designing the curriculum for multi-point entry exit is, a, is an involved process. The industry must be mapped. And within the industry, you need to figure out what job roles are available. 
and the con the the uh, curriculum for the first year or the certificate level curriculum must be so designed that the skill sets that you that a child will have will be uh, uh, will enable him to join a certain job role at the entry level of an industry similarly after diploma similarly after degree similarly after honors degree and so on so therefore now the curriculum will need to be designed with extreme focus on what the industry is doing now having said that there are multiple industries there's a pharmacy industry there's a manufacturing industry there's a even in manufacturing you can manufacture boilers you can manufacture aircraft you can manufacture uh, pumps and and so on within the electronics and communication engineering you have multiple industries and so on so therefore i am going to create first year curriculum second year curriculum third year curriculum to fit which industry so therefore i will have to now figure out there are, there, within my curriculum i have three uh, mod uh, three parts the first part will be prerequisites the second part will be core subjects and the third part is the elective now my prerequisites is something that i need to become a certain uh, specialist in certain discipline and so on the core part will support my uh, entry to a certain specialization the electives will give me those uh, those skills which i require to fit into a certain industry so you define the industry sectors there are about 20 different sectors in the uh, country for each of those sector now you map within that sector what job roles exist and for those job roles what combination of prerequisites what combination of core subjects and what electives are required so therefore now the Uh, the entire curriculum will be completely retrofit to what the industry requirement uh, is so that's about multi point entry exit now let's look at what is academic bank of credits every course that i do in a curriculum for example i said after first year i get a certification let one year credits be as a as a example 50 credits i need to complete one year of study and that is i get a uh, certification after one year of study in a college now having said that <clears throat> for 50 credits let's assume i am going through 10 different courses in the first year what is a course physics is a course mathematics is a course you know chemistry is a course and so on so i go through 10 different courses let's assume five credits per course so to get my certification in one year i need to complete these 50 credits accumulation of credits means i am now allowed to complete those 50 credits at my pace and my time which means if there is a semester semester system followed and if there are five courses per semester i will select three courses in this semester two courses in this semester and maybe another five courses in the next semester which means in order to complete one certification personally i am taking one and a half years or maybe two years and so on while doing this i will accumulate my credits if i pass three courses my 15 credits will go into my notional bank whenever i complete the next course you add five more credits and so on so whenever i complete my 50 credits i get my certification so what i am doing is my credits have become the unit now for my measurement and those credits are now being uh, you know uh, put in a notional academic bank right now this is one way of looking at it now let's look at another way of uh, another look at let's look at it in another way suppose i am let's say uh, registered in your university the currently nautia university and let's say uh, i in the first semester there are five courses in the second semester there are five courses at the end i get a certification now uh, five the first five courses i want to do in my registered university 
the next two courses in the second semester i want to do from a neighboring university and the other three courses i will do from a third university now what happens is i will need to be recognized by the other university for or registered for those two courses in a second university and the remaining three courses in a third university and assuming this is possible the when i complete two courses in the second university that university will give me 10 credits and thus those 10 credits will again come into my nation uh, notional academic bank when i whenever i complete the third university three courses 15 credits from that university will come back into my notional academic bank so in this process what i am doing is i am getting my credits from different places and this is possible only if if i start working on credit as a unit if i do anything else i am stuck to my single university so therefore uh, if if i if i feel like physics is being taught better in another institution or another university i may want to register for physics in that university why should i Uh, study physics in the main university in which i have registered so all this is possible in academic bank of credits and it is established to facilitate transfer of credits the same thing goes around in the second year in the third year in the fourth year and so on now while doing some courses in the second year in the second university some courses in the third university and so on there are certain basic requirements when i when i say that i want two credits to come from another university why should the other university accept me so therefore the main university will have to create an mou with the second university with the third university saying that if my students come to you you recognize my credits i will recognize your credits and so on so those kind of mous will have to be drawn between universities and this exchange of credits will happen only between those institutions which have an mou to do this so that is about academic brand bank of credits and so on now there is a third point the tuition fee is paid for the main university for all courses now if the student says two courses i'll go to another university how is the tuition fee going to be paid there or is the student going to pay again the tuition fees so this is this is also a problem that can be simply addressed by means of a credit now i have said that the fundamental unit of education is credit so therefore if today for a, for one year i am charging let's say 50000 rupees for 50 credits then my uh, per uh, credit is about 1000 rupees so therefore i will uh, when i take two credits from some other institution i will transfer 2000 rupees there from the or the institution the main institution in which i am re registered will transfer the appropriate amount based on the credit to the other university and so on so that is how the whole system works and it's a it's it's a basics of basic of uh, uh, personalized uh, learning and so on now when i say flexibility of subjects i have already told you that within the curriculum there is uh, prerequisites there is core and there are electives now these electives are all built on what the industry requires which industry one wants to go and things like that so i will come to those slides a little later so you will understand the whole concept much better so fundamentally we have we allow students to learn at their pace learn what they want and learn where they want and allow them multiple entry multiple exit and uh, give credence to their credits wherever those credits are coming from as long as they uh, satisfy the requirements of a credit in terms of assessment examination and so on that is the first part more of this we will come in uh, some slides later now as far as uh, the other things are concerned there is a national research foundation which is extremely good regulation of higher education with single now today we have aict we have ugc we have pharmacy council we have architecture council there are so many 
councils and uh, a university running multiple programs will have to run to different uh, regulators and so on. So therefore, having one regulator is, is good, but then uh, we will need every discipline has its own uh, you know, system on which it's built. They have all grown uh, much beyond what they started off with. So therefore, even under one regulator, you need a very highly specialized sections which look at different uh, requirements of different uh, educational verticals and so on. So therefore, even under the Higher Education Council, you will need a specialized department which looks at technical education, one looking at science education, one looking at pharmacy education, and so on. So that probably is work in progress and will keep happening. So affiliation system to be removed in 15 years with graded autonomy is a, is a good concept, but then we have 40,000 institutions and so on. So how many of them can be really made autonomous? Autonomous will come with responsibilities. Autonomy will come with responsibilities. And in order to survive on autonomy, you need a lot of funding. And if the institutions cannot find that funding, then what is the use of their autonomy? So therefore, these are these are all uh, things which need to be discussed over a period of time, and uh, methodologies uh, to be should be evolved over a period of time. Then there are a technology forum to be created. It's already formed. Then NEP 2020 emphasizes on gender inclusion fund. This is extremely good, and special education zones for at disadvantaged regions and groups. Multilingualism, yes, I, I have said the, the education today uh, is also allowed in local languages. It's a good idea, but then we need to provide employment opportunities also to support the local language uh, uh, idea. Now, the, there are several student attributes that we uh, that the policy talks about: critical thinking, creativity, scientific temper, communication, collaboration, multilingualism problem solving, ethics, social responsibility, and digital literacy. One attribute that I've not written here is cognitive flexibility. Now that is extremely important. If you look in today's industry sector, the skills that one has, has a shelf life, which means if I become a, uh, let's say an electronics engineer and get certain kind of skills, those skills are probably there with me for the next three years because after that the technology may change. If the technology changes, my skills uh, may be useful, may be underutilized uh, or whatever. So therefore, a constant reskilling is required, a constant upskilling is required, and so on. Now, it also means that the environment within the industry all is also changing because the skills that are required are changing. So if I can, with my basic electronics engineer, if I can move into different industries without any difficulty and start working, then I have cognitive flexibility. Now that is something that, is, that will be required as we um, move ahead in time. Then. Uh, like I said, uh, these these are the uh, you know complex problem solving, critical thing. Now all these skills uh, have uh, you know methodologies available today. There are several courses available. There are third party uh, skill providers available. There are third party education content providers available who build these skills in a child, in a student, uh, and therefore uh, I don't think these things are really a challenge. Now let's look at some of the emerging job opportunities and we will know what is actually happening in the industry and how we need to really design the curriculum for first year, for second year, third year, fourth year in different industries. And then uh, also look at the skill sets that are built that I'm talking about as per NEP. If you look at the 10 top jobs in India, we have AI, ML, data analysis, information security analysis, big data, fintech, you know, business development professionals, and so on. And on the right side, I've given you the number of jobs available. In privacy and trust, we have 1 million jobs. In cybersecurity, 6 million jobs. In data analysis, 20 million jobs, and so on. So these are this is the distribution of the jobs, which 
simply means that I need to make my curriculum more technology driven and more uh, with the current curriculum needs. And I need to create a digital job capacity irrespective of my uh, specialization that I do without losing the, uh, the core fundamentals of that discipline. For example, if I am a mechanical engineer, I cannot be learning everything that is computers, but I need to learn mechanical engineering, but their applications to cloud computing, their applications to AI, their applications to ML, their applications to big data and so on. So that is how the curriculum will have to be designed in times to come. Now there is one other uh, dimension to the curriculum uh, that we are offering today. Our students become very uh, you know, outdated if we don't follow this in future. We need to offer industry micro credentials. What is this? They, like I said, the skill, skills that one has as a job has a shelf life, which means maybe three years, four years, my skills will become obsolete. So therefore, I will need upskilling. I will need reskilling and so on. So I can't go to college again to do upskilling, to reskilling and, and, and so on. So therefore, several industries offer their specific courses like solar energy. Uh, you have Siemens offering several courses. Uh, and uh, for example, wind energy for Suzon, you have several courses uh, being offered by and, and things like that. So which may not be a part of the regular curriculum. So even after you complete bachelor's program or master's program, you need to upskill yourself every three years, every four years with these micro credentials, which are offered by tech companies, which are offered by industries and so on. These may be small fractional credit programs, which means they may be uh, half a credit, they may be 30 hours, they may be 20 hours, 15 hours and so on, but they help you in upgrading uh, yourself. So th this is about while doing, while offering micro credentials, you also need to teach digital topics to every discipline that we have, whether it's mechanical, civil, electrical, computer science or electronics or whichever. So digital topics must be taught in such a way that they apply the core principles of that specific discipline. Then the next is integrating cutting edge content, which means whatever is currently there in the market must be integrated with the curriculum. Then we need to empower the faculty to keep up with demand for fast changing digital skills. It's not only the students who have to be trained, but faculty also must be identified and made to go through this uh, reskilling and upskilling uh, that, that's happening. Now, this is an essential skill map that I'm showing you, which will help you in designing the curriculum for NEP. There are seven verticals the world over where jobs are available today. For example, engineering, data science, product, finance, marketing, manager, anybody who gets a job today will get into one of these areas or, or some allied area of this. But the, largely the seven verticals are engineering, data science, product, finance, marketing and managers. Irrespective of which, this, now this skill map is independent of the discipline that a student may have. He may be an engineer, he may be a science graduate, he may be an arts graduate, he may be a psychologist, he may be a doctor, whatever. Irrespective of what discipline he has, he may be for job, he may get into an engineering product company, he may be getting into a company which is essentially into data science or into a company which, pro, which has different products at, as its portfolio, or he may get into a finance division or a marketing division or a managing division. Three essential skills are necessary. Business skills, tech skills and data skills, which you see on the left. So assuming that as an engineer, my interest is to get into a finance company, like for example, a uh, you know American bank or maybe his, uh, your uh, Hong, Hong Kong Shanghai uh, bank or whatever. 
so which whichever the idea is you are now after being an engineer you want a career in a finance uh, in a world now if that is the case you will need business skills of mathematical finance financial modeling and financial engineering as technical skills you will need microsoft microsoft excel vba you need algorithmic trading you will need visual analytics and for data skills you need forecasting you need business analytics you need data visualization now this is how this matrix is uh, looked at now if you get into data science after uh, let's say you are a computer science engineer and you want to make a career in data science then business skills will be business case development project planning leadership then technical skills will be nlp sentiment analysis deep learning data skills will be python tensorflow machine learning so this is how this this matrix is looked at now all that i'm saying is the curriculum must be conscious of what is happening with the industry and look at this data that is that i'm trying to present and design the curriculum accordingly then the future's jobs obviously will require new future new skills so there are different uh, you know opportunities versus the growth there is a care economy with healthcare economy which which has huge potential for new jobs and on the other side there is green tech less jobs but the growth is very very high and which means green green energy everything that is green the sustainable development goals also talks about green technology and so on so green technology on one side care economy on the other side health care economy the um, and in between you have data artificial intelligence you have engineering cloud computing sales marketing content product development people and culture now these are the places where new jobs are available and as you can see a lot of technology drives these new jobs so it's very necessary to be uh, to be uh, in Uh, line with the new technical skills that are required we found in the last uh, you know 3 4 years a lot of uh, jobs were hit by covid and if you look at this jobs requiring bachelors this is vulnerable jobs against wages you know accommodation and food services was the most hit arts entertainment accommodation food service was the most hit then the next hit was real estate retail trade and so on so what survived was professional scientific technical management education agriculture finance manufacturing these are the jobs which are which survived so you can understand what what is happening and uh, accordingly work out now future education is also about you know uh, about underlying drivers economic structures labor dis because of the new uh, transformation that is happening within the industry there is a lot of labor displacement that is happening from one job to another from one skill to another skill and so on and there is an emerging landscape so if you look at the underlying drivers you connectivity is driving us machine capabilities are increasing demographics is changing and social expectations are therefore changing when you look at economic structure everything is becoming modular there is nothing like a complete system which is purchased it's all unbounding work fragmentation things like that and everything is becoming global Pro productivity you know there are factor shifts there are technology impact capital efficiency industry divergence and so on so therefore this is another chart which will be very very useful in understanding what exactly is happening around us in the industry how the labor is displacing and therefore how the universities must uh, connect with the new changing scenario of the industry now, there are 10 top technologies that are driving our uh, world today these 10 technologies is also called as the industry 4.0 now whenever when we design our curriculum nep or otherwise we need to look at these technologies and therefore make you know uh, meaningful interventions in our uh, in our curriculum it's not about smart factories this is just an example the technologies around are driving every single discipline 
whether it's smart factories or whether it's healthcare or whether it's green technology or whatever. So what are these 10 technologies? AI, machine learning, RPA, you must have seen on your mobile so many messages which you get, uh, which uh, say that, uh, you know, you want to register for some or open some bank account. They will tell you to, you know, do a lot of uh, steps. And then, or if you are doing a KYC registration, there are a lot of steps that you have to follow. Now, all this is a part of RPA, Robotic Process Automation. Then blockchain, IoT, cognitive computing, intelligent apps, virtual reality, 5G and DevOps. Now, these are the technologies that are driving. They will find some way into civil engineering. They will find some way into electrical engineering. They will find some way into entertainment. You name the discipline, these technologies will find their way. So therefore, our curriculum must you know, change accordingly. Now, the, there are several challenges. I mean, we need to understand the industry if we want to you know, uh, design our curriculum. Therefore, I'm uh, taking you through these slides. Industry 4.0, it, it encompasses every single area. Autonomous robots, simulation, horizontal and vertical system integration, you have IoT, in the I, IoT, cyber security, additive manufacturing, augmented re reality, big data analytics. So everything put together is industry 4.0. And it affects all the steps of the value chain. And what is the value chain from, from uh, an idea to the time that it is marketed you have a value chain which talks about you know um, everything digital manufacturing engineering design you have uh, life cycle data management you have customer relationships you have enterprise resource planning erp you have machineries industrial communication shape the entire value chain is affected today and mind you every one of you will find some job in one of these areas and therefore your curriculum must fit the skill sets that are required in these uh, steps of the value chain. So on one side you have IoT, which is essentially sensors. And on the other side you have product innovation, process innovation, autonomous agents, mm -hmm. and digital networking. These are the processes. In between, you have industry 4.0, industry digitized services, digitalized services, smart products, smart factories, and so on. And there is a block which I have left blank, and that indicates that it is an industry 5.0. So, when uh, till date, uh, you know, you must be understanding in industrial revolutions. It started with printing press, then it went into semi automats, then it went into a lot of computerization. Then now we talk about machines talking to machines, and so on. And in future, we will talk about industry 5.0. And that is, that has a little understanding that uh, must be made. In uh, initially, when industry started, they only looked at profits. So what is it that I am spending? What is the profit that I am getting? That is the only driving force for an industry in the early days. Then people thought that this is not the correct way of looking at an industry. The industry survives because there are people working within the industry and therefore we must really appreciate their effort. So for the first P, which is product, product based, the second or profit based, the first is profit based. The second we added people onto the profits. So we get two P's. Then the third P, you know, is the current point. It's not sufficient to look at the profit. It's not even sufficient to look at the people who are actually working in factories, in industries, contributing to GDP, and so on. We must look at something more than this because every raw material that I'm using in order to produce something comes from the nature, comes from the planet. So therefore, if I'm only producing, only producing, only looking at people, only looking at profits, then someday the planet will collapse. So therefore, the third P is planet. So make profit, look at people, but protect planet. 
Now that is industry 5.0. So looking at all this, now we will look at the curriculum that we need to design, looking at the NEP requirements. So at the top, you look at the career. Where is that place that you want to work? That is the career. And on the other side, you have hands on learning. The learning that must happen at the base level in order to reach the career that I have in mind. Then we get on to core that we have to study. Then there is an emerging value addition that I have to do. Then I have to connect with other disciplines because no product today is based on a single discipline. Every product, whether it's a car that you drive or a mobile or a washing machine or whatever um, uh, equipment you talk about, it's multidisciplinary. So therefore, I have to create some links to the knowledge that I get from other disciplines. So that becomes multidisciplinary. All this together will give me my career. And my curriculum should also be built like that. And what is the core? It's either engineering, business, science, or liberal arts. So in one of these areas, the career will happen. So I, I will show you here a small mapping that I have, we have tried to do. Career paths for jobs business students want. Now uh, students uh, do a BBA, an MBA, or a management course after engineering, that the joint degrees, dual degrees, which UGC allows now, and so on. So where do where are the jobs that they are looking for? One is digital product management, entrepreneurship, data analytics, digital marketing, sales and business development, fintech, operations and supply chain, AI and machine learning, and digital transformation. These are the jobs that a business guy is looking for. So what are the subjects that they have to learn? If it is entrepreneurship that is looking for, entrepreneurship laying the foundation, how to finance and grow your startup without venture capital is the kind of expertise that you require. So these are the career paths for jobs business students want. The next is in our curriculum, we need to look at guided projects which cover a range of competencies. For example, in uh, your supply chain, one may use the a lot of COVID data is now available. So using COVID-19 data to make supply chain logistics decisions in spreadsheets is a supply chain problem. It's not COVID-19 problem, it's a supply chain problem. Then in HR hiring and onboarding employees with ClickUp, these are the kind of projects that one must do within those four years that I'm talking about. So after first year, you get a certification, di diploma, degree, honors degree. But within that period, the value addition that you should make for a product management portfolio, a, the product life cycle, you know, then for marketing, it should be small business marketing, things like they're using Facebook and so on. So this gives you a wide range of competencies from guided projects. And these guided projects can come from industries. They can come from third party uh, ed tech companies like uh, like you know, edX, uh, your uh, Udemy, Coursera, things like that. Then let's look at uh, all this time. You may be feeling that the whole thing is technology based and so on. It's nothing like that. Like I said, the this whole business that I'm talking about is discipline agnostic. It doesn't depend on any single discipline. However, I'll tell you the career paths for job for job science students want. For example, somebody is doing a four year BSc program in chemistry. Today, you don't learn what the earlier chemistry students used to learn. Today, if you have a BSc chemistry program, you need to learn battery development. You need to learn nanotechnology. You need to learn electric vehicles. You need to learn drug discovery. This is BSc chem chemistry in the new world. If you are learning mathematics, you, you learn data science, you learn decision science, business intelligence, forecasting. This is the mathematics that you need to learn. Of course, there are prerequisites which you learn in the earlier years and so on. But these are the jobs that these people want. Then if you are doing, let's say, BSE biology, then bioinformatics, genomic science, industrial biotechnology, epidemiologists, 
these are the things that where the job, new jobs are coming up. So therefore, the curriculum must fit this, and within the NEP framework, they all will make great uh, sense. Then, uh, like I said, there are uh, prerequisites, which is the foundation. There are hands-on projects, there are electives, and so on. So decision science specialization is something that one can really look at. Having done all that, we come back to, again, more features of the national education policy. Now, what does that mean? Now, NEP suggests multidisciplinary higher education system and a simplified university system to emphasize on professional humanities and pure science streams. Science is the mother of everything. Everything comes out of science. So the building blocks are very important. What are the building blocks? Physics, mathematics, and so on. These are the building blocks. Without this, there cannot, cannot be any applied science. So you cannot build an engineering foundation, an engineering building on poor mathematics foundation, on poor physics foundation, and so on. So therefore, NEP suggests a very strong you know, foundation, and then you build on that. Everything comes out of that. Uh, for example, your liberal sciences, your social sciences, your whatever you talk about, uh, it all, the, ba the mother is the science. So therefore, it's very necessary that you build a strong science foundation if you really want to be in the engineering uh, or maybe the applied science uh, stream. And today, if you also see the nomenclature, you have you know state private university, state public university, central you know domain private university, central domain public university. You need a, you have a you know all kinds of deemed university, deemed to be university. All kind of terminology exists. So the NEP tries to rationalize that, and that's a good thing to do. Now, um, pitching for multi, see, uh, NEP also talks about research which should be multidisciplinary. Like I said, every product that you see in the market today is multidisciplinary. They are, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, specialized uh, knowledge required from different disciplines. Uh, for example, if you look at a completely electronic product, the casing is a plastic, uh, uh, you know, uh, casing. So you need a lot of plastics technology to, to be understood. A lot of a lot of it is, uh, you know, 3D printed. So you need a lot of uh, manufacturing base that is required and, and, and similar. So there are a lot of uh, different uh, disciplines coming into creating one single product. So therefore, research cannot be the, cannot be limited to one single discipline. So research also should be multidisciplinary, going across disciplines. It should be interdisciplinary. And there must be research between civil engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. There must be research between mechanical and computer science. There must be research between structural engineering and uh, data science, things like that. So then um, pitching for, uh, you know, that, yeah. So multidisciplinary research is one. Then any regimentation in education can be counterproductive. So therefore, the universities should be allowed the freedom to create courses which are in line with what the industry requires. Then there is a recommendation of the new research foundation. Uh, that's a good idea, but sufficient funds will have to be allocated so that research doesn't suffer in different organizations, different universities, and so on. Now let's look at the quest. What are we looking at from the NEP? The quest for quality education is knowledge, deductive, and experiential. See, when, when you go to university, the university is expected to give you deductive learning. What it means is, from whatever I have learned, I should be able to analyze, I should be able to uh, infer, I should be able to ex extrapolate, and so on. That is deductive learning. And the second is experiential learning. Experiential learning is what you get on the job. They are hands-on skills-based, competency-based skills that one is talking about when, when one talks about experiential learning. Now, unfortunately, today the times are such that a university is supposed to provide you deductive as well as experiential 
learning. Otherwise, people are saying that your students are not employable. Now, this puts additional challenges on the university. And therefore, the only way to do that, that is build skills also in addition to the uh, theoretical knowledge that one gives, which means that there must be a complete synergy between the industry and the education, which is again what I'm talking about right from the beginning. So, and there are certain concerns. Concerns include cost, high cost of education, workforce development. How do I develop the workforce? Because the industry is diverse. Within the university, how, for which industry do I develop the workforce? What kind of curriculum do I teach people? That is a challenge. Then competency-based education, which means at the end of the day, after one year of education, if I want to drop out and do something, and then come back again. After that one year, I should have some competency-based education, some competency skills, which will find me a job. If that is not the way my curriculum is designed, then why should I drop out? Then it is business as usual. So therefore, uh, competency-based education is important. Accreditation, who certifies that the methods that I'm following in my university are right, wrong, indifferent, whatever. So accreditation is important. Assessment is important. Some, some third party should assess me. Then quality assurance. There are in the, uh, all of you must have gone through the uh, NAC documents and so on. And you write a self-assessment report. You also create, pro, pro, uh, what is that, uh, course outcomes, program outcomes, and so on. Now, uh, there is a NAC peer team that comes, reviews, and then says that you improve here, improve there and so on. That, that's not the end of it. Let's assume we will create a situation where a program outcomes are written in the website, in the prospectus, and suppose later the stakeholders find out that you are not following certain program outcomes, certain course outcomes you are not able to provide. Then the stakeholders will reserve the right to sue you, to take you to court. Now that is quality assurance. And in time to come, whether we like or not, things are moving in that direction. So then skill leadership, crisis, challenges, online education, these are all challenges. And the digital platform that I'm talking about has answers for many of these challenges. Then the policy, there are several opportunities. Any policy must connect education and available opportunities of employment. Employment opportunities must grow. It is not, see, there is a supply side and there is a demand side. The supply side is the universities, the institutions, and the students that they produce. That is the supply side. You have an industry side. The demand side is the industry which absorbs these students. Now, there must be a synergy between the supply and demand. Otherwise, if number of students increase and the number of jobs are less, then you will have a problem in the society. And if it is the other way around also, you will have a problem. But in this country, we have sup more supply and less uh, uh, you know, demand, which means we have lesser number of jobs currently. Uh, or at least the jobs which fit the, uh, the uh, outcomes of a graduate that we have. There, there are more graduates coming in and these number of graduates may not find appropriate jobs outside. Now, these are some of the challenges that must be addressed. So employment opportunities must grow many, many times. We have several industry bodies like CII, you have, uh, you know, ASUSHAM, you have FIKI and so on. And you have NASCOM for IT related activities and so on. Now, one expects that they provide you a uh, you know, some kind of labor management information system, which exactly tells you how many people are required in which sector, and then the education system can be accordingly designed, proper skills can be given, and so on. But this country being so large, uh, the expectations are high, the aspirations are very high, so you can't bring in such uh, equations which may help a mathematician, but they may not actually help the society in the sense that we may prevent somebody from, uh, you know, becoming an engineer because just because we can't guarantee him a job. 
So those kind of things cannot happen. The NEP talks about a lot of expansion and, and so on. So whenever that happens, things will be much, much better. <clears throat> and we need to forge alliances. The entire national education policies talks about collaboration. There is complete collaboration. For example, if two universities do not collaborate, your multi-point entry exit, accumulation of credits, personalized learning, nothing will happen. If you are, uh, if there is no MOU, no transfer of credits, and similarly, if there is no collaboration between research institutions, between universities, between, you know, for example, CSIR labs and your university, no research, meaningful research will happen. No interdisciplinary communication will happen. No multidisciplinary research will happen and so on. So the whole idea is collaboration and you need to forge alliances. So strategic alliances with global international partners, with local universities and so on. So you need to look at internationalization, which means that students from other, univers other universities abroad must come and learn on your university. And faculty from other universities abroad must come and spend at least one semester on your university. Similarly, your students should go out and study. Your faculty should go. This is not faculty exchange program. This is not student exchange program. That happens for one day, two day, one week maximum. What I'm talking about is three month minimum, a student must stay on your campus, learn a course and so on. And a faculty must at least be there for one semester, uh, you know, teaching one course on your campus and things like that. That's that leads to internationalization. And then the collaborations will build across universities, across countries, and so on. Now, major advantages of, for the academic community is research funding. They get a lot of funding opportunities, practical learning opportunities for students and for industry. Then lower research and development costs and technology transfer opportunities also happen that affect competitiveness. So the whole NEP talks about collaboration, collaborate with your peers, collaborate with your, uh, you know, people in the other disciplines and so on. That's the way to go in NEP. So lack of internationalization is, is a problem. It affects the global rankings. Foreign students and faculty must be there on the campuses. They are currently nil. So. Every, you know, there are strategies which can be uh, applied for increasing the number of foreign students on a campus. Maybe some other time when we uh, meet, we could possibly discuss those strategies and so on. Then postdoc researchers on our campus are very, very rare. It all shows that the research, even if the potential is there, is not being exploited to the extent that it is possible on our campuses. Now, in all these things that I've explained today, technology is the driver. New teaching learning models must emerge in education. And so the only way you can do that is build a digital learning platform that I'm talking about. It's very simple. You, in a traditional university, you have multiple functions. You have academic functions and you have uh, administrative functions. Within the academic functions, you have teaching, learning, examinations, assessments, and so on. And within uh, the administrative functions, you have uh, you know fee collections, you have course distributions, you have uh, conduct of examinations, conduct of assessments, and so on. So you have ad academic and administrative functions, which together is the function of a university. Now, if I uh, bring in uh, software uh, based applications to do my, uh, for example, teaching learning. I will have, uh, you know, uh, uh, digital content and I will have a platform to uh, project that digital content. Then I'll have analytics to find out how the students are performing. Then I'll have analysis to find out how teachers are performing. Then I will use simulation labs to connect with the students for some amount of uh, experimental uh, learning and, and so on. So we, and the rest of the administrative functions, I can use an ERP, I can use a CRM 
and so on. For academic functions, I can use LMS. I can use multiple things that are required. So what I am, uh, what I have informed you right now is that all the academic and administrative functions of a university can be replicated on a digital platform. Now, the minute I do that, I get a digital university, a virtual university. And this virtual university, anybody can register from anywhere, learn anything. Only thing is technically it's not a digital university, it's a hybrid university because some of the hands-on skills can only be done hands-on. So most of the theory part can be done on the digital platform and wherever the skills are required, you need to connect this digital university part to the skill centers. So together it becomes a blended learning model. That's the future. And the 50 GER that NEP is talking about is possible only through that route. So uh, a strong BPR model, business process re-engineering model is needed if the objectives of NEP have to become real. And the new model must organize around various processes using technology all the time and traditional functional faculty centric courses beating the geographic boundaries that becomes the future uh, reference for a university then you have let's say nep also talks about uh, academic autonomy about autonomy now first of all autonomy has four different facets one is academic autonomy administrative autonomy, managerial autonomy, and financial autonomy. Unless all four are there, autonomy is no good. NEP talks about empowerment of higher education institutions through autonomy, which is extremely good. But the four facets must also be provided because without money, nothing will run. Uh, autonomy will be only on paper. So, um, but the difficulty is we have 45,000 colleges in the country. How many of them will become autonomous? After becoming autonomous, how, can, how many of them can stand on their own, uh, you know, on their own without needing the support of uh, either the state or the center or the private enterprise or whatever? So these are some of the uh, problems. And autonomy will survive only when the vice chancellor is a towering personality and a leader par excellence. He creates his own space and leads from the front and then autonomy thrives. If tomorrow you have autonomy is given, but for everything, if uh, the institutional head has to go to the nearest uh, government office and uh, plead his case, then what autonomy? Autonomy, it's better without autonomy. So these are some of the things that also must be looked at. The future world is virtual and networked. We have been hearing about virtual and networked institutions operating across traditional boundaries. Now, from, to, uh, from now onwards, you will need Velcro institutions. You know Velcro? Velcro is something where you, uh, you know, twist, turn uh, in different directions and stick anything to anything. So you need our universities also to become like Velcro institutions. It means not structured things. Today I'm uh, doing BSc, BCom, BA, engineering and things like that. Tomorrow we may need to connect BA and BCom, BCom and engineering, engineering like that. So it, it's in spirit, it becomes something like Velcro operation within a university. Then setting up online blended virtual universities would add uh, value to NEP that 50 GER that we are talking about and national skill qualification framework of which I am the author, the mass massification happens. Skills and education must come together. Otherwise, you cannot connect with the industry with your curriculum. Then virtual laboratory simulations, they, are, they add value, but they cannot replace the real. So blended learning with actual hands on skills is a must. Examination systems must transform from end semester or end year to continuous evaluation. We have been for long talking about year end exam, semester ex end exam, and then making students go through that. Then we have a process of, you know, assessing them, examining them, assessing them, and then several people fail. Then they are allowed to keep terms. Then they come back into the system. It's a big mess. So, and the vice chancellor, there are several universities where vice chancellors feel very happy if they examine.
conducted success, successfully. So where is the time for academics? Where is the time for research? And so on. So we must, the NEP also talks about continuous evaluation. So after every unit, you divide the entire coursework into units, smaller units, and each after each unit, you may have an exam, you have an assessment, and the marks that come there are carried forward, or the grades come there, which come there, are carried forward. So you have a complete continuous evaluation system. There is no year-end exam, there is no semester-end exam, and so on. But then a continuous evaluation will put extreme uh, uh, load on the faculty to perform not only in terms of producing uh, meaningful, you know, based uh, uh, criteria, but they also will be required to be of highest integrity. It is not because everything now is within the reach of the faculty. Now, if they uh, play partisan, then the sufferer will be the student and the system will, you know, fail. So therefore, Continuous evaluation is extremely good, but the responsibility shifts completely on the uh, faculty and uh, the systems. So our, our entire education system must provide multiple entries, exits into different uh, sectors from base level education into PhDs and job markets and come back in all that. And now all that is a feature of national education policy. Now, when, when I spoke about the digital platform, there is still one problem of content. Where does the content come from? You must be knowing and must have worked with Swayam platform. It's, it's similar to a learning management system, and there are a lot of content is available on that. Now, that content uh, will be actually uh, becoming a part of your MOOC uh, aggregator business. So, uh, you need to uh, MOOCs becomes the uh, the you know binding force in the digital learning platform. So all the di uh, distance open learning content from third party con content providers, from what you provide, from what you develop, from what other universities develop, other institutions develop, or what Swayam provides, all that being is aggregated on the digital learning platform. So you don't have to have now physically separate universities, physically separate institutions and so on. So from this slide, you will see University 1, University 2, University 3, 4, 5, N. You can connect all of them where on the digital platform where MOOCs becomes the aggregator. Then the regulators, professional bodies, advertisers, sponsors, everybody will come on that network. So you will have one single virtual university which connects every single university in the technically in the world, technically in the country, and maybe in the local jurisdictions, a few universities, few institutions, and so on. So there is a value in return for fee. The fee can come down. The customer is the student. Customer is the employer. So MOOCs addresses both of them, and value in return is the introduction fee. So this is how the MOOC uh, in future MOOCs will become the aggregator on a digital platform. Then the uh, one more aspect of national education policy is also how to uh, connect our research to products. Now there is a lot of research being uh, done within our IITs, IIMs, your NITs, your some of the good private uh, universities and, and so on. But that research doesn't come together to create a product. They are all very good researchers moving. They publish very highly rated papers in very highly rated journals, but at the end of the day, they don't come together to create products. So therefore, they, what, what can be done? Because product is multidisciplinary. People are working in their silos, how to bring them together. So you need universities which will start housing research centers of different industries on the campus itself. In the world, there is a. Um, in Germany, you have Max Planck universities and Fraunhofer universities. Max Planck University does uh, basic research. Fraunhofer University does applied research. And a Fraunhofer University technically is, is one university on a thousand acre campus. And around that campus, every single industry sets its base, its research arm, 
its small pilot production plants and so on. So it's a one big township where there is a single Fraunhofer Institute at the center and there are multiple, you know, smaller industries of every sector on the same campus. So the, there is ideation. From the ideation, it goes to the uh, drawing board. A concept is created. A you know virtual uh, prototype is created, and once the uh, uh, prototype is uh, is to be uh, tested out, it goes through the <clears throat> multiple industry campuses on the on that uh, you know front of a institute uh, campus, where they start producing the prototype actual prototype and once the prototype is created different uh, of different components they all come back to the phone of our institute then the ideation shifts to assembling them then system design then creating a pro complete product and so on so we need something like that on our university it's it's easy to make that uh, the concept may be a little uh, tough to begin with but then it's perfectly possible. There is no extra funding required, but all that can be uh, worked out in our environment as well. Then the papers that will be published will be truly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, because now you are not looking at only your small area, but you are also looking at multiple areas as to how they will react with your area. That is what is required. That alone will make startup make in India initiatives come alive with new markets and employment opportunities coming up. Now, what that front of our institute does is, uh, for example, if you if a new product is to be created, uh, the ideas of which come from the society. So there is a research arm of this front of our, which goes to the society, finds out their needs, requirements, or it goes to the defense establishments, it goes to agriculture. It goes to uh, energy sector, gets new ideas, new requirements, and starts ideating and creating new products and so on. Now, while doing that, it uh, disaggregates at, at the system level, which means the uh, mechanical engineering uh, components are segregated out, electrical is segregated, software is separated, things like that. So you create an individual supply chain around each of these uh, you know, segregated element. So, which means now a single Fraunhofer Institute is connecting to a me good mechanical engineering institute, a good computer science institute, a good electronics institute, and then that will connect to more institutions, that will connect to more industries, and so on. So, this whole thing will uh, become a big township of productization. So, that will generate startup, make in India initiatives come alive and that will improve the GDP share in a, in a share of GDP in, in the industry perspective. And the only way all this can be done is collaborate, collaborate on projects that solve real world problems. Vasudeva Kutumbakam, revamping undergrad, which, which means, you know, the, all the whole world is a state, we are all one. And therefore, everyone should come together. The, the underlying principle is collaboration. So you revamp undergraduate education with multiple entry exit operations, requires employment markets to be equally dynamic, opportunities and challenges that globalization efforts must be used in the control and management of both students and their learning environments. For example, today's computer company can manufacture components in China, assemble them in Mexico, ship them to Europe, and service the purchases from call centers in India. What is it this if, if it is not Vasudai Vakutumbakam? So this is this will lead to Atmanirbhartha. It will lead to self-realization and that dispersal creates demands for new learning models. To this whole concept of collaboration brings in new learning models. And if you are only sitting in your home looking at a small aspect of your life, then no new ideas will ever come. And the credit bank gives unthinkable opportunities for not only reaching education to the unreached, but even allows them to build corporatized degrees. You know what the corporate wants, that kind of degrees can be done. That is personalized learning. The student will come and say, I want to learn this in this semester. I want to learn so-and-so in some other semester. 
all that is bound by the prerequisites, the core and the electives and the audit courses that you build around it. Now, a lot of choice comes from the student himself or herself. And that is the uh, personalized learning and is possible only through collaboration. So we come to what is personalized learning that we started in the beginning. Imagine a complete personalized learning idea. A physics course from Punjab University, mathematics from TIFR, chemistry from IISC, astronomy from Aryabhata Research Institute, AI from IIT Hyderabad. If I combine all this with some prerequisites from core and some electives, I will get a career in astrophysics and I can't physically go to Punjab University to learn physics. I can't go physically to TIFR in Bombay to learn mathematics. So all this must happen online, which means digital learning platform that I'm talking about. So you need a digital platform, you need collaboration, you need MOU between all these institutions that they will exchange students that they will uh, you know, value the credits given by the other fellow and so on. And that they, they will share the resources, they will share the faculty, they will share the content and so on. So modern skills can also be built as value addition to rising in the corporate ladder. So for working professionals, you, you can create similar courses on the same virtual platform, on the digital platform. I'll give you another example. In Agile Manage, suppose you want uh, improving business skills with a course in Agile Management from Martin Krupp, uh, a leadership primer from Texas Tech, or our very own IAM Kohi code, or improving technical skills with in data structures and algorithms from University of California, and so on. You know, that also can be done on a digital platform. But NEP as on date doesn't allow this, this going out of the uh, country for collaboration. So, but technically all these are possible uh, and you need not have the digital platform located in Mumbai or Chennai or Bengal or wherever it can lie. It can be anywhere and service everyone on the uh, globe. And the implementation strategy is to provide a virtual university environment that I spoke about where all universities in India become collaborators. Every university becomes a collaborator, creating their own content, sourcing content from other third party players and placing all that content, content on a MOOCs aggregator on the digital platform. You all must have heard of Google career certificates, which is similar to this. They provide value addition and so on. Having said all this, we must look at the digital divide. During the COVID, we found that many people didn't have access. They didn't have instruments. They didn't have uh, machines, the mobiles and things like that. So therefore, we must look at their requirements as well. And that digital divide must be addressed. Content must be interactive, interesting, innovative. Availability of devices uh, can come from BSNL, NIC, their uh, collaboration must be sought. Then sanitized mobile PC vans can be created, you know, where you can create the skill centers inside a, you can create a skill lab inside a vehicle and take that vehicle to the village and park it there and provide education to the people there. Then you drop them at the village, move to the next village. So all these are possible. All that you will require is a data point set up at that village to provide the internet access and uh, you know downloading the content videos from wherever they are available. And if maximum throughput and minimal interference is required, then you one can also use channels 1611 on the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band and DTH channels that the government has announced can be used. And even cable TV network can be used for reaching out education at different times. It, it need not be when live, when the, yeah, like in a classroom, it can be recorded and shared over different media platforms. It can be shared over WhatsApp as well. So future universities must look at change of organizational structures. There must be change of business model, cooperative structures, interdisciplinary must happen. New concept for faculties and departments must happen. Change of accreditation procedures will happen new exam offices, no fixed degree programs, acceleration cycles will change. 
change of teaching methods will happen. New teaching concepts, new teaching infrastructures, digital rights movement will take, you know, uh, uh, will become a reality because there's a lot of digital content that will come in because of our requirement to reach 50 GER through NEP policy. Then change of learning methods will change massive versus personal. Today we have 100 students, 200 students in a classroom, one teacher teaching and so on. Tomorrow we are talking about personalized learning. Every, every student will may have different requirements of learning. New learning infrastructure, increased computing capacities, shift from presence learning to distance learning. This is all the concept of a un university in future, which will be completely AI enabled. Every activity of this will be AI enabled, whether it's canteen support or emergency or marketing or academic or whatever you talk about on a traditional university will be AI enabled. Only change is permanent. So therefore, let us adopt change. Let's look at very positively with uh, on uh, NEP, adopt NEP and make the best of it in our education. The new world will need to transform into facilitating student centric paradigm, unlike the current faculty centric paradigm. Faculty decides everything today. With NEP, we want the student to decide, decide what how the faculty should uh, teach and what it should teach. All the stakeholders will need to retrofit their expectations to the new realities emerging. But the transition from classroom teachers to guides to course mentors is not easy. Tomorrow, the faculty is not a teacher. He must become a mentor. He must become a guide. He must handhold. If there is third party content being beamed, then the teacher must handhold the student in explaining that third party content. So his role from teaching has changed to becoming one of mentor and guide. It does not work if the education supply chain is not in sync with the market requirements. Now, these are the references that I've used and uh, whatever anybody needs, they can always uh, come back. You all can reach me. I'm there all over the place. Uh, this is my uh, mail ID. This is my Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube. I have a music, uh, I have a uh, channel. Uh, not music, it, it's ba basically on education. And uh, so this is how you can look at me. So I'm stopping presenting and I'm uh, coming back. Uh, so that that's it, the, I've completed my presentation and I'm open to questions, thank you. Hello. Hello. Yeah. 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 Uh, sir, I am uh, Dr. Shantanu Rechi Yeah. From Neutral from Neut University Economics. Yeah. Uh, excellent deliberation, sir. But I have some few doubts as well as uh, some issues relating to the policy. Yeah. So first thing is that perhaps we have uh, we are going uh, towards the paradigm shift from the Gurukul system to the Sishukul system, perhaps, perhaps yeah. if I'm not, not wrong. But three wrong. issues that are very important. First thing is that suppose a particular student, it is relating to the possibility and plausibility. The first a particular student has completed his uh, some uh, credits from one university to and some credits to another university from where he will or she will be rewarded. This is the first thing. Second thing is that that is very important. Suppose it is possible. But now say a particular student is moving from uh, Bengal to Punjab, but there is no more memorandum of understanding between the universities of the particular locality where he actually shifted himself. So what will happen then? And third question is that the huge st structural change, obviously it is welcome to the uh, the need of the time, no doubt about it. But from where the fund will come? Yeah, first of all, a student is registered in a certain university and that university will only award the degree. 
they which means that if i if a student takes two credits from some other university that some other university will transfer the credits to the university in which he is registered so the academic bank is is uh, is is the property of the uh, university in which the student is registered so all the updation will happen in that account so the only the credits will come from some other uh, university some other institution and so on so there is no problem in awarding the degree by the university in which he is registered that's the first point the second is this will happen only if there is an mou between these three four universities from which the students are exchanging credits so up front there needs to be an mou so what does that mou do it says that i will recognize your credits you recognize my credits this is the amount i will share this is the amount you will share this is how we conduct exams this is how we will do a, a assessments and so on so all those things will become part of the uh, part of the mou and the third is if there are credits coming from some other university in which, which is there in some other state for example bengal and then we have uh, punjab and so on then also the mou is the key if the university has an mou with that university in bengal uh, sorry in punjab then it is fine otherwise it will not happen that is why i said collaboration is a must in this so in that case suppose for each and every student if they uh, just at the at the maximum i am asking for yeah. the maximum many students are somehow, somehow actually uh, spread it to different parts of uh, location or different locations to different states so uh, the mother university has to Uh, settle the mo with all other universities where the students actually went no no see when you say that multiple point entry exit accumulation of credits personalized learning it is not as if the whole world is available to them initially right. as a university right. university will make attempt to go to the best in institutions around them so if you are university as some mou with uh, iit karakpur then that is possible but if karakpur says no what you will do so that, that, uh, that so that what is the funding sir funding funding, sir, see, funding if you want to provide something some funds are required if you are a private university then you will have to generate those funds if you are a public university then the government will have to provide some funds but otherwise to implement this part you don't need extra funds i'll tell you why today if you have 10 courses in one year or let's say five courses per semester and you want you have uh, charged him uh, let's say uh, 50000 rupees per uh, semester 1 lakh rupees per year assuming then out of that 50000 rupees you have five courses which means one course is 10000 rupees you have already charged from the student 10000 rupees for all those courses which means you have charged 1 lakh rupees per annum for 10 courses from the student at the beginning of the year now if you want to implement nap then assuming that two courses he wants to do from some other university and you have established an mou then 20000 rupees you transfer to that institution so where is the extra funding required from but yes i mean lot of uh, facilities will have to be created lot of uh, uh, you know they, you need a digital platform you need uh, investments into digital technology you need to look at your university in terms of digital transformation now all that is will, will require money so that investment you will have to do somebody has to do yeah okay sir thank you sir thank you thank you very much for such an informative valuable critically analyzed uh, we must have to say lecture and uh, which includes the structure the strategies and the credit points distribution as well as the emerging job possibilities uh, in the guidelines of the new educational policy that is nep 2020 thank you very much sir thank you and now another um, uh, member 
Vijay Kamle, Vijay Kamle and other participants, you may ask your uh, query. Be very precise no. and ask your query. Yeah. Am I audible? Vijay no. Kamle. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Am I audible? Okay. Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Uh, I am from Digati Eastern Karanji. I am from Digati Eastern Karanji. I want to ask two questions. First question for multi entry exit education system, four levels will be there, four levels of skills will be there. So, for mechanical engineering, what will be those four levels? And a second question what are the institutes which are running this, this uh, multi entry and exit system? See, first of all, multi point entry exit before implementing. In engineering will have to be really thought of. The uh, concept is very good, but then the engineering program is already four years, unlike the science program, which was three years. So in the in a <clears throat> science program, for example, your four years is after first year you get a certification, after second year you get a diploma, after third year you get a degree. After fourth year, you get a honors degree with extra credits and so on. Now that is the concept. Now having said that, the engineering program is a four year program already. So if you are building skills after every year, it is always good. So how to build skills, what skills have to be built is depending on the industry outside and for which industry you are mapping a certain discipline, for example, mechanical engineering. So after first year, what skills are you building for a mechanical engineer? And those skills are useful in which sector, which job role, which industry? Now those are things which have to be worked out. I mean, there is no easy answer on that. But uh, expecting that after every certification level, every year, there will be a commensurate job opening is also not correct. Though that is the spirit. Yeah. 